So, hi everybody, we are live now. So hopefully we didn't lose a bunch of people here. Um, we had some technical difficulties. I apologize for starting late. Um, but anyways, I am Marcia Civic with Be Provided Conservation Radio, and I have two special guests with me today, and it is Siobhan Kidd and Jack Wonderly. And we're gonna be talking about their book that is coming out in October um, called Searching for the Snow Leopard, Guardian of the High Mountain. And um, so anyways, so we're gonna be talking about snow leopards and snow leopard conservation as well. And I have a couple of their bios to read or their bios to read before we get started. And just to let you know, if you do want to ask questions, please leave a comment under the comment section on the Facebook page and we can answer them as we go. And um, we'll see how that goes. And if questions aren't answered today, then we will try to get them afterwards. I'll forward them to Jack and to Siobhan. So, so again, thank you for joining. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our guest today. So, so Siobhan is the Outreach Conservation Educator for the Snow Leopard Conservancy and speaks to a variety of audiences about snow leopard and the conservation of this iconic species. She also serves as social media manager, maintaining the con Conservancy's presence on a variety of platforms. She is responsible for the online newsletter and maintains the Conservancy's website. In addition, she handles online fundraising sales and she joined the Conservancy uh, team as an education intern while completing her Master's of Liberal Arts and Sciences and was centered around a post-baccalaureate certificate program in zoo and aquarium studies with a focus on conservation education and anthrozoology. While at Western Illinois University, she conducted anthrozoological research in examining the adoption of animal companions. As an intern, Siobhan developed a multi-age snow leopard conservation education program, including educational activities appropriate for school age children. And she, if you can't tell by that, that she has a large, huge passion for wildlife, in particular big cats. And she was a zoo docent also for 17 years and was the program developer and coordinator advisor of a junior zookeeper program at a local zoo for about eight of those years. She also spent a summer at the Nashville Zoo as an instructor in their summer camp program. And she even owned, which I didn't know this, owned and operated a pet supply and gift shop. And she was also a medical and radiate, a radiation oncology transcriptionist, if I can say it, and editor for more than 20 years, which I, I didn't know. So, and she's also still teaching at some intermediate and high school grade levels as, as guest lecturer as well at Western Illinois University. So welcome, Siob <clears throat> excuse me, welcome Siobhan. So, and now Jack, who has a very impressive um, bio, bio as well, he is an outdoor commercial and editorial photographer from Sonoma County. He's worked as an animal photographer for National Geographic Society Books and National Geographic Kids Magazines, creating images of jellyfish, giraffes, snakes, bears, and many other species. His photograph, or photographs have appeared in numerous publications, and I have one of his cheetahs back here, if you can see it. And um, he has also appeared in numerous publications such as National Geographic, Sunset, and Los Angeles Times, Alaska Beyond Magazine, and Ranger Rick, as well as CNN. And he is represented by National Geographic Image Collection. And you can see his work at uh, www.jackwonderly.com. And Jack is spelled J-A-K, there's no C. And I will post some of this information as well. So Jack uses his photography to raise awareness and funds for, for select conservation organizations that include Nature Conservancy, National Resources, Defense Council, and Wild Wonders of China. He is passionate about large cats in particular, and his expedition for the snow leopard, which we're going to hear about today, um, was one of his most challenging and adventurous projects yet. And um, so I hope we can hear about that. So 
<laughs> so Jack is often in the field, but when he's not traveling, he spends every Sunday with his young daughter vol volunteering at his local wildlife rescue. So welcome, you guys. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so sorry for the... Uh, the, the technical difficulties at the beginning of this. I apologize. <laughs> We're so. all still learning about all this technology <laughs> since we've been shut in. And <laughs> exactly. So, well, I'm excited because I love, I love the snow leopard. I don't know if people can see there's a snow leopard picture behind me as well that um, I, I bought at uh, WCN for donation, which is, um, they're just beautiful, beautiful cats. So I'm excited. So anyways, before we get started um, talking more about the snow leopard, I, I know that, um, you know, I just read your bio, but I was hoping to hear from both of you a little bit, what got you inspired to do the work that you're doing and um, get involved with this, you know, and make it your life's passion and work. So I thought, Jack, I would start with you, if that's okay. Okay. And um, I just wanted to, you know, what inspired you to be a, con a you know, a photographer and what got you involved, you know, with the Snow Leopard Conservancy? Um, you know, I, I, this is sort of a second career for me. I, I used to work in advertising and digital oh, software that. visualization tools. And, um, I, you know, basically I worked with creative people. I went to art school. So it was always a, we were always making two dimensional images of one kind yeah. or another. Um, but I had a career in that world first. Um, and then, I don't know, when I got to be probably in my early 30s or something, I was losing interest in that and was never completely passionate about it. And photography, which I'd studied a little bit in college, but never took seriously, started to become a regular hobby. I lived in San Francisco at the time, and I used to go over to the San Francisco Zoo. I was sort of working for a company on the East Coast. So we, we would wrap up work at two or three most days, which still gave me time to get to the zoo before they closed at five. And I would oh, nice. go to the big cat enclosures and take pictures of the snow leopard and the tigers and I mean, all kinds of stuff. But that was where I really started to work on my photography. And then I started going to other zoos and I would take pictures. You know, I've always been an animal lover, but um, that's when it really started to come in with the photography. Yeah. And so then I'd go to Sacramento. They had snow leopards and tigers and other cats. And, um, you know, then I went to San Diego and then I went to Seattle and I went <laughs> to basically all the zoos on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, at that point, I didn't have a way to go to India and take pictures in the wild. So um, and then I had I started to accumulate the snow leopard and the tiger were always my favorite. And I started to accumulate um, I don't want to say a portfolio, but you know, I had, I had some good photos. Yeah. I spent three days at the Seattle Zoo trying to get good photos of their snow leopard, just standing there waiting for them to not sleep. You know, um, yeah, big cats like to sleep a lot. That's hard. They like yeah. to sleep a lot. And yeah. actually, I learned a few things at the zoo about snow leopards. Like they, um, if you spend enough time at a snow leopard enclosure, you find out that they usually, if they're being sly at all. They don't move until you look away. So if I could stand there and look at that thing all day and it just stares and, you know, pretend, the minute I look down or do something, it moves. Yeah. yeah. They don't like to be seen moving. So there were some things that I, that I learned doing that. But um, I just approached the Snow Leopard Conservation Organizations, the Snow Leopard Conservancy, and I was like, I have these photos. Can I donate some? Do you need them? Can I make prints and you can sell them at their fundraisers? And that was quite a while ago. That was maybe 2007 or eight. Yeah. And so that's when I first met Darla Hillard and Rodney Jackson and stuff from the Snow Leopard Conservancy, and I might go to a fundraiser and stuff. So this goes back quite a ways for me mm -hmm. to when I was actually just turning professional as a photographer. So I eventually left the corporate world and decided I was going to be a photographer. And I really wanted to do wildlife and travel and stuff. I didn't know from a business standpoint, I had no idea what that looked like. Um, uh, nor did I know that it takes, you know, probably a good five years to establish yourself as a photographer. So the beginning was, was a lot of fits and starts and trying to figure it out. Um, but that's that's how the relationship with the Snow Leopard Conservancy first started and where the photography interest came out. 
That's interesting. And you like film photography, right? You like, I believe it's a, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, a Rolleiflex or ro- how do you, uh, how do you uh, say that? On it, Rolleiflex. <laughs> Rolleiflex, yeah. 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 Um, the Rolleiflex is a camera that was popular in the 50s and 60s. And it's a, a box. Well, I can show you. It's right here. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My dad had one of those too. This is not the kind of thing I would probably get a snow leopard photo on, Mm -hmm. but I take it on all my trips and I use it, including for wildlife, as much as possible. Yeah, that's great. And Um, just because it's different. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, it's way harder. Obviously, I get 12 frames and then I got to change film and everything's like (laughs) manual and stuff. You really have to think about your picture, too, with film. It's not like digital. You can snap off 12,000 photos and look through them later. You know, you're... you're yeah. Yeah, you have yeah. to be a little... There's picky. no autofocus. Yeah. Everything's manual. <laughs> you got to use a light meter. You have to move very slowly. But when you're in close proximity to an animal, I think it actually works very well because you're... Um, you're in a kind of submissive posture. Yeah. You look down into the viewfinder and you're not kind of up in their face. So... Um, when yeah. I get close to an animal, when that's possible, it's it's a great um, thing. Yeah, that's sort of my crazy passion project. I like that. Well, that the reason why I brought it up too is when you said that every time you look away or put your eyes down, the snow leopard would move. And I figured with that camera, you almost if you're at the zoo, you might just kind of look down into that. Maybe it'll you'll catch something. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so um, I know you went on an incredible adventure trek um, to the Indian uh, Himalayas um, for Snow Leopard Conservancy, and I hope we can talk about that later. But I wanted to hear from Siobhan and hear from her on how she got started with the Snow Leopard Conservancy. How did you meet, uh, you know, Rodney and Darla, who are... Mine's a pretty long story, too. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Back in, I can't remember, it was 2000, maybe 2004, Yeah. Um, I saw online that uh, Project Survival Cat Haven was holding a big cat experience at UCLA. And I was like, ooh, I want to go. There was going to be a snow leopard person and a jaguar person and a cheetah person mm-hmm. speaking. And so I booked my plane fare and headed out and it was Rodney and Darla that were uh, the snow leopard people speaking at this event. And so it it was a long time ago. And then um, I, I followed them for years, but then when I went back to grad school and realized that I was going to have to do an internship, I thought, aha. I know who I want to do it with. <laughs> so I, it was an education. Um, mine was in conservation education. So it wasn't like, you know, going out into the field. Yeah. And uh, I went out to the WCN Expo for the first time in San Francisco in October mm-hmm. of, I think it was 2013. And I saw that they were going to be there. And of course, me, like lots of people who come up to our booth at the expo, <laughs> I went up to him and introduced myself. And I said, do you guys remember me? And Darla's like, oh, yes. And uh, in fact, there's a picture that, that WCN took of us hugging at, at that expo. It's kind of funny. And it was on their website and I grabbed it. But oh, fun. Um, so then I had run into them again. Well, yeah. then a few weeks later, I called her and said, hey. Darla, can I do an internship? And she's like, well, I don't know. We don't have interns. And she goes, well, wait a minute. What do you want to do? And then she said, well, you could do it from Illinois and you wouldn't have to live out here. And, and you would, you know, for a short time and pay for the rent out here. And she said, and if you could work it in with the zoo that you have there, they have snow leopards, then sure, let's do it. So um, I did the internship with them and then as soon as I was done along came another expo and I was sitting there next to Darla and I said how about a job and she's like I don't know and I said oh come on I can do something on the internet and I bothered her and bothered her until finally she gave in <laughs> and uh, persistence her, my is first key project was 
to come up with an eco-friendly t-shirt for the conservancy and it's led from there now i'm i'm i do all kinds of projects and i never know what project is coming and when darla emailed me and said hey i have something that's right up your alley i was like oh goody what is it and she said well we have um an ambassador in Australia. Her name is Margaret G and she's a literary agent and she would like to do a children's book where you seek and find the snow leopard in the pictures. Oh, fun. And she said, how about I put you in touch with her and you'll be on your own and you guys can work it out. And I'm like, sure, why not? <laughs> Famous last word. And <laughs> so then, um, I got in touch with her and I said, oh, I can find you a lot of photos. And at that time, I wasn't thinking specifically manually taken wild snow leopards. Mm -hmm. and, but I had worked with Oriel Alamani, uh, who's from Spain, and Bjorn Pearson from Sweden on an article for our newsletter. And I got in touch with them and I said, hey, would you guys be interested in helping me with this book? And okay. they were sure no problem and then um, Bjorn said well you know what would be really cool is if we just use photographs of wild snow leopards no camera trap photos all manually taken he says because I think that would go along with your idea you know about the experience of looking for a snow leopard mm -hmm. and and how everyone has an experience that goes looking for this big cat and so it just led from there. Uh, the next person that came on board was Tashi Gali from Nepal. Uh, Rodney, our director, had taught him how to do camera trap photography. And then he started to do photography, wildlife photography. And he, uh, he's just branched out. He loves photography. And he was, he's, sure, I'll, I'll be on board. And then I asked Katie Duffy, who's an independent snow leopard researcher who lives in Ohio, if she'd like to come on board and because I'd read, she has a blog mm -hmm. and her writings are just beautiful. Right. And I said, but Katie, have you got some pictures? And she's like, sure, but they're mostly uh, like conservation oriented. And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and then um, we asked Susan Leibick, she's from Canada. She's an artist and a writer. And she had uh, published some things about snow leopards. And then Jack, and you, he'll have to tell you all about his experience. Yeah, I want to hear had it. Just gone on this experience on this trek to to photograph snow leopards and i said to darla do you think he'd participate in the book and she's like sure just email him so then then i snatched jack <laughs> right up so <laughs> and uh he was real happy and he can tell you all about his trek but that's how it kind of brought the team together but i've been um of course interested in these big cats for my whole life at the zoo where I was a docent they called me the cat lady <laughs> and uh, I was there 17 years That's standing out in front of the tigers and the lions and the jaguar and the leopards and the snow leopards talking about them I even got to work with a baby snow leopard oh and nice. she would uh, she tore all the shoelaces off my shoes and uh, <laughs> She was, she'd been a little orphan cub that they had to bottle feed. I got to bottle feed this little baby lion and oh it was quite an experience. And, uh, but that's, I've always been interested in, you know, the big cats. They've always been my passion. So it's just one thing has led to another. And this is like my dream come true job. And that, that's uh, amazing. Yeah. And it's, and I'm an example of, of you, it, life doesn't necessarily begin at 20, you know, <laughs> you don't find your dream job at 20. I got my master's in my fifties. So yeah. it was, but I'm so fortunate to be with the conservancy and working with them and having a chance to speak to people about snow leopard conservation. But this project has been amazing, just yeah. amazing. I'm so honored to be able to work with all these people and get to know them. And I'm the only one of the whole crew that has not seen a snow leopard in the wild. So it's uh, <laughs> someday. Even yeah. Mark <laughs> yeah. went to Ladakh, India, and she saw a snow leopard in the wild. But I'm the only one. But uh, that's amazing. So, but you I'm will. A big company. I've learned from all of these people. It's it's amazing. That's great. But, uh, 
that's my story. That's so. wonderful. Very inspirational. I, I'm totally with you. I, I find my passion, I finding my passion later in life. It, it, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 20. Well, I did, but I went a different path. Now I'm going back to my original idea. So anyways. Well, but I started kudos. out in music education and biology. Yeah. That's what I got my BA in was music education and, and biology. And uh, I, of course, was interested in, you know, wildlife and wildlife conservation, but I never thought I could, you know, I was timid. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, the book is dedicated to uh, Jeanette Thomas. She was one of my professors in grad school and uh, she passed away a couple years ago. But when she was oh, getting sorry. her uh, her advanced degrees, her professor, her advisor told her when she said, well, I want to study snow leopards. And this was like in 1974. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, it's way too hard. Nobody can do that, especially a woman. You can't do that. So she went on to study what else seals in, in Antarctica. So <laughs> she showed him, you know, <laughs> she was studying marine mammals in, in a harsh environment. But uh, that was she she said to me, you know, snow leopards was my passion, my original idea. So that's why the book's dedicated to her. Oh, that's great. I'm going to flash a cover of the book, hopefully with my technical difficulties and production skills. I don't lose you, but let me, so people, <laughs> I wish I had a copy. So I, I, you guys probably can't see it, but I think the people live can see it. And I also have a list of contributors. So, so Siobhan, you're, you're the, um, you're the co-editor. I'm the editor. Yeah. I'm the author. Yeah. And uh, Bjorn Pearson agreed to write some of the text. So Bjorn and I are, have written the text. And then there's an essay. There's multiple essays from some of them. But there's an essay from each of the contributors. And they're they're all professional writers as far as I'm concerned. They're just beautiful. Yeah. Just beautiful. Jax is magnificent. Wait till you read it. I, it's so I can't cool. wait to get my copy. Yeah. Well, sorry. <laughs> the release date is October 6th. Yeah. It's, it's in being printed now. So it awesome. finally got off to the printers. Awesome. Well, we should start talking. We Well, I do have a couple. There's a few hellos. Um, Ashley Lutz Nelson is on. She says, hello. Hi, Ashley. Yeah. That's our VP. <laughs> yeah. And Amy from Florida. I know Amy. Hi. And, Hi, Amy. And Ron from Staten Island. He's, um, Hi, Ron. He's a big cat guy. And Varpu Maria, if I said that right, from the Netherlands. So we have people from wow. all over on saying hello. So She follows us on Facebook. Hi. Awesome. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the snow leopards. Jack, I want to hear kind of your adventure your trek through the Himalayas and um, you know as from what I hear snow leopards are shy they're elusive they um, oh did we lose Jack now oh no there there, there you are oh. <laughs> just a little blip yeah yeah <laughs> so anyways I can't I, see you but I'll get I'll get it back okay I could we can see you so I okay. you know I know that snow leopards are elusive and shy and many people have di difficulty from what I've read anyways of seeing them. So what was your adventure yeah. like going to photograph this and how, what was it like to see your first snow leopard? Did it, yeah. I'll, I'll let you tell uh, the story. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, they are notoriously shy, um, almost to, I mean, they have an almost mystical reputation mm -hmm. and some of that is to camouflage. I mean, if, they don't really have to hide if they just stop moving you can't see them oh yeah um, yeah you know their their camouflage is so extraordinary that if they just lie down and sit in place you know the blue sheep which are their prey animals will walk right by them you just they just disappear oh amazing um so the challenge uh really is to find them and um and then the other challenge is the the, the difficulty of the um, the location so you're at 12,000 feet on the low end and snow leopards go up to 19,000 feet oh um they're they're the highest dwelling mammal predator yeah um so they're they're just extraordinary in terms of they live in places that we're not meant to live um and that you know we, we have to see them in the winter because uh as the snow line 
um, drops down the mountainside as it gets colder and colder, the snow leopards come down lower to a place that's more manageable for us to find them. Um, so you, we um, planned this expedition with Rodney um, and Darla from the Snow Leopard Conservancy. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between saying like, I wanna see a snow leopard versus I wanna photograph a snow leopard. Um, most snow leopard sightings are from a quite a distance through a spotting scope that might be half a mile or something away. Yeah. Um, with a scope, you know, it's still a magical experience, but in order to photograph one, I need to be within a couple hundred yards of a snow leopard. Um, so I can't go where there's going to be a lot of people. I can't um, move quickly. I have to hopefully find a snow leopard that has caught something because then it's motivated to stay put. Yeah. Um, so you have to basically, we had to plan an expedition that's specific to photography. And um, we were able to do that with, with the Snow Leopard Conservancy's help um, and with Susan Jannon's uh, donation and fundraising help. Nice. Yeah, Susan um, just came on, by the way. Hi, Susan. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Susan. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, it's it, this photographing a snow leopard in the wild was on my bucket list. It was definitely something that I'd wanted to do. I'd photographed all the other big cats uh, in the wild. And the snow leopard was sort of the top of my bucket list. And I just approached Rodney one time at a fundraiser. And I was like, so how hard is it really to see one? Because obviously he has so much field experience and knows all the right people yeah um and so we you know we had that conversation and then mm, many months later um they the snow leopard conservancy came back around and said would you be interested in going Heck and i yeah. was like of course i would be interested in going and they were like we just need to find a way to to fund it and that's where susan said i you know i can help so yeah um it was crazy because i just literally got a text message saying they want you to go to India and photograph snow leopards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then my next reaction was, oh my God, what have I signed up for? Yeah. Um, be <laughs> because it, well, well, first of all, there's no guarantee that you're going to see one. Right. Um, you have to fly to India, then you have to fly to Leh in, in the Himalayas, which is at 11 and a half thousand feet. Mm -hmm. And then you have to trek into the wilderness and sleep in the cold at 12 or 13,000 feet for a week or two. Um, and camp yeah. and it's 20 below at night. And I had never camped at negative temperatures and I'd never been at 14,000 feet or any of that. So I, you know, no. I was nervous about the, just, is this even safe? <laughs> um, but we have a really good group. Uh, so we basically hire, uh, we work through Jigmit Dadul, who's, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, but he's the, he works with the Snow Leopard Conservancy in India. And he has a team led by his son with spotters and guys that can set up camp. Um, but it was amazing in terms of just the experience of this trip is, is unlike any other wildlife experience that I've had in that it felt like a true expedition i mean you literally strap gear onto ponies and walk off into the mountains um and set yeah. up rugged tents and um it felt like it could have been 75 years ago or something because yeah you're completely off the grid um you can't use satellite phones there um yeah so don't hurt and, yourself yeah <laughs> yeah um it's just an amazing <clears throat> thing just to be in that territory um and it's a you know that part of india is is very much tibetan buddhist and and i enjoyed soaking up some of that um but the the trip in terms of finding the snow leopard was literally like get up at seven o'clock in the morning strap on your backpack have some tea hike up hill which the first few days you're at altitude like that is just absolutely oh, brutal i mean walking on flat lungs. ground is an up to is is really difficult and then going uphill with a back on is extraordinarily difficult mm -hmm. and then we would find a good vantage point and we'd spread out we had four or five guys looking at a time through spotting scopes and we would stare at mountainsides for nine hours yeah. <laughs> um trying to find any movement any flick of a tail an ear twitch or something um yeah, and they could be sitting there down. staring at you. Yeah, they you, could did, be you wouldn't there know staring it. Staring at you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, 
and it would get dark about five yeah. and we'd, I'd have dinner in the tent. And then from, you know, from five until seven, mm-hmm. the next morning, I got 14 hours of darkness and bitter cold. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just hunker down in your tent and multiple layers of everything. And, and, you know, I had to put anything that was uh, the camera batteries, you know, my contact solution, everything had to sleep inside my sleeping bag because everything freezes. Oh yeah. Um, my pants freeze. Like my down pants just are like cardboard in the morning. And, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's not comfortable that way. Now, if you're, yeah. if you want to go and see one, um, without trying to photograph it, they can make it a lot more comfortable. You can stay in a homestay and, um, you know, get a little more culture and stuff like that. But because we were trying to photograph it, we were off on our own. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just, just the acclimating to the altitude and dealing with the temperatures. And then it Uh, took about eight days of looking before we had any, um sign of a snow leopard yeah i was gonna ask how long how long did it take so it took you eight days to see your first snow leopard huh yeah the whole trip was 16 days there's like a a day and a half of travel a couple days of acclimation we spent eight days in stock valley in northern india camping and looking and um decided that we weren't seeing anything promising there. There weren't any tracks or signs of snow leopards. So we relocated. And as we packed up camp and were hiking out of the valley to relocate, when we were able to get a cell phone signal, they called uh, Jigmet from the Snow Leopard Conservancy and said, hey, uh, you know, have you heard any news? He's because he knows everybody in the region. And if there was a snow leopard sighting, he would know about it. And he said, yes, a snow leopard killed a yak in a village and um at ule and you should come immediately because the snow leopard will likely still be in the area so all of a sudden you know my heart's racing and i'm like oh my god we might get it because i was down to only two or three days left on my trip yeah and at this point i was completely empty-handed in terms of getting photos so um we hiked out of the valley we got in a car and we drove three hours to um, this new location and um it worked out in the sense that a snow leopard killing a yak is not good for um it's basically that's human wildlife conflict right we've got a domestic animal that's been killed by a wild animal and historically the farmers who have the livestock would want to get retribution they want to have that cat shot or stoned to death or whatever method they could manage right. um, to protect because you know the people there make so little money and their livestock is really their nest egg it's their livelihood it's their wealth um it's not like a pet this is what they're this is absolutely their lifeblood right um and so traditionally you know that's where we had retribution killings against snow leopards um but the snow leopard conservancy has all these amazing programs in place in areas like this to discourage that kind of behavior. So one is the ecotourism, uh, there's uh, the homestay program, there's you know arts and crafts. These people make little snow leopard dolls and do mm-hmm. things like that. So basically we're trying to turn the snow leopard into an ally for the community instead of this vicious predator. That's and great. Um, because I happened to stumble into this situation, where a snow leopard killed a yak, we were able to document that whole um, process of on the ground conservation, working with the community. Um, and, you know, people, for example, like if we, we had to go through this farmer's land to see where the snow leopard might appear. Yeah. And so we would make a little cash donation to the farmer for that privilege. And so he's like, oh, great, you know, snow leopards around and I'm making money. And I'm like, I'm getting to buy a snow leopard, a yak burger. Like, I really felt honored to, like, contribute in that weird way. Yeah. Um, But even though we knew the snow leopard was nearby and we, you know, by then the word had gotten out and a few more people from the village had shown up. And we had like eight people staring at this mountainside and you can see the yak out in the field. And you're looking at the big mountain and you're like, okay, I know the snow leopard is here. It's unlikely he's going to take his eyes off his kill, but it's not present. You know, we can't find it. Um, And then this little kid from the village came up and he said, the cat's over there. Um, Because he had seen it leave and where it went. 
Yeah. And so finally somebody found it in their spotting scope and it was just a little brown bump on the mountainside <laughs> that blended in with all the other rocks. And I, they showed it to me in the scope. They're like, it's right there. I'm like, where? They're like, it's in the middle of the scene. It's like dead in the center. Of the I don't see it. And then it lifted its head. And you're like, oh, that's not a rock. That's a cat. Yeah. Um, but the amazing thing was the cat, you know, the, the cat basically just went down the other side of the mountain after a couple of minutes. And we were like, is that it? Um, but no, it did come down at night to come to the kill so that it could be with it and feed. And so we went back in the morning in the pitch black before um, there was any light at all and wow. set up a blind. And then I could sit in the blind and be a couple hundred yards from the yak and the snow leopard. And as the sun came up, it was there. Um, and in, oh, in total, I had 12 or 14 hours probably looking at the snow leopard. Wow. While he was, um, while he was eating dinner? While he was hanging yeah. around, yeah. basically just yeah. guarding it oh, mostly. Okay. Um, guarding it from magpies and foxes and anybody else who would try to come and get some some food. Yeah. Um, and we think it was a, a female snow leopard. Um, but that was incredible because most sightings are so fleeting and brief. And I basically just had a staring contest with this cat Amazing. for like a day and a half. Um, <laughs> because it, it was always looking in our direction. It knew there were humans on the ridge and, and you know, it wasn't, uh, it certainly wasn't oblivious to our presence. So, um, wow. We just, yeah, that and makes, it was just yeah. close enough to get to get good photos so with an eight hundred millimeter lens, which is about like this. Um, <laughs> Super heavy, it too. Was just yeah. close yeah. enough. That's yeah. amazing. So it makes all the the frozen pants and contact fluid <laughs> worthwhile at yeah. that point. Absolutely. You forget all about that stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, amazing. I absolutely forget about it. And it yeah. um, you know, that was that's definitely that's that's one of those trip of a lifetime dream come true kind of experiences. Um mm -hmm. you know, like like lions are cool and you can go to Africa, but it's so easy. I mean you just get yeah, in a Jeep and they drive right you out and within an hour there's a lion and it's it's so easy. Yeah. But the snow leopard, there's no guarantee and you have to work so hard at it. Yeah. Um which makes it all the more rewarding when it happens. That's amazing. I think I have a picture here. I, it might be the one of it with the yak, but um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, I posted one today on our yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, you really can't. I know you guys can't see it, but I think uh, people can out in the world there. So hopefully everybody can see that. Yeah, the snow leopards just kind of blends right into the terrain there. Um, Jack's a, essay was perfect for the book um, to bring it all together. Yeah. Because so many of the essays, well, all of the essays are about this experience of this mystical, magical cat and having a bond with it and feeling, you know, that there's something spiritual about this trek. And mm -hmm. that's what you read across the literature. of Everyone who's gone in search of the snow leopard, they have some type of a spiritual experience. But Jack found the snow leopard close to people in danger of, you know, possibly being killed mm -hmm. herself. And and then he, and it talks about the conservation of the species. And and so his essay just brought the whole thing together. It was perfect yeah. to bring the the mystical part the spiritual part of the snow leopard um the anthropological side together with the conservation side it was just um it's a, i can't wait for everyone to read his essay it's just wonderful. thank you <laughs> it is I, I just want to second what she said like it does feel like when you go and do this it feels like a pilgrimage yeah um it absolutely felt like a, a, you know kind of a magical pilgrimage um, and then, and yet, you know, like she said, this is a very real conservation, you know, issue that has to be addressed and the Snow Leopard Conservancy is addressing. Um, so, you know, there's this magical, mystical side to this cat. And then there's also a very practical, you know, it's under threat from various pressures like many animals are. Yeah. Yeah, There's yeah. a whole chapter, Amarsha, in the book about the folklore and the spirituality of the snow leopard. 
Oh, that's and great. Then, but there's also the, one of the final chapters in the book is about conservation. It's an overview of snow leopard conservation, about the threats that the snow leopard faces and yeah. the methods that the conservancy uses um, to work towards its preservation. Uh, but I love I, that. I, I have some of the essays with me. Um, I wanted to read one for your audience. Um, it's not very long. I would love as that. As, as long as it doesn't blow away. <laughs> I'm sitting, My I, we live out in the country yeah. and our internet is awful. So I'm sitting down here by the Mississippi River in town where I have much better um, service. This particular essay is from Katie Duffy. She's the researcher, and it's called A Voice in the Silence. I bent down to look at the pug mark in the powdery snow. The dryness of the climate had perfectly preserved each of the billions of snowflakes, allowing the individually unique icy stars to sparkle under the cloudless sky. Just as I was trying to estimate when the snow leopard had crossed this valley and observe which way it had headed, a chill ran up my spine at the sound of a piercing cry that echoed among the peaks. My teammate and I froze. The overwhelming silence of the land was replaced with the rapid thumping of my heart in my chest. One more time, the yowl reverberated into the valley. I stood looking at my teammate in awe with two words being trailed by a puffy cloud of my frozen breath and a huge grin on my face, snow leopard. <laughs> I love that. It just takes you there. It does. I love that. I'm really excited to get my book copy now. <laughs> so I, whenever you're all set to, I, there, Ron had a question for Jack, but I can wait until you're done with them. Well, you have ahead. another essay to read. I'll do I will that. after, go ahead and take some questions. Do you want me yeah. to do that? So Jack, um, what can you tell us about the snow leopard's anatomy that lend its incredible skill of jumping or pouncing on such rough terrain? You know, that's a good question. And I did quite a bit of homework before this trip, but yeah. specifically why they're such good jumpers. I don't know that I have a good answer for that. They are often considered the best animal leaper period. They can jump. The best estimate is 49 feet, oh, wow. which is about the length of a school bus yeah. on flat ground. Um, that's incredible. You know, they are absolutely physically incredible animals. And there's some amazing videos out there of snow leopards hunting, which is hardly ever seen. But when somebody gets it on camera, it is jaw dropping the pace at which they can move over this terrain. And when you've been in that place and you understand how steep and rocky that terrain is, I mean, it is nothing but ice and sharp rocks and loose, sharp rocks. I mean, yeah. there's almost no sturdy footing anywhere and they sprint down these mountainsides. They often hunt from above and sprint full speed down these mountainsides. And I mean, and also wow. the prey animals like the blue sheep are just amazing at covering ground. Um, the snow leopard's very well adapted to its environment and things like it has, you know, like large nasal cavities so that when it inhales air, mm. it, the, the air is warmed before it actually gets into their lungs. Um, part of the reason they have such a long tail is because they can wrap it around their head for warmth. Oh, nice. Um, I didn't know You that. know, they have large paws with a lot of fur so that they're basically almost like walking on snowshoes. And you can see that in the tracks um, in that essay. You know, she talks about seeing a track. And I will say that just finding a track was pretty much made the trip worthwhile. I mean, just to see a yeah. snow leopard footprint in the snow is a pretty magical experience. But their pug mark, the actual pads are kind of like medium sized, but then the overall outline of the footprint is there's a larger footprint outside the pug mark um, of the pads because they have so much fur there. And so they've kind of got this soft footed way of moving through. Oh, so I don't yeah. know if that answers the question about the leaping exactly, but. Um, yeah. And that's what conservationists do, Marsha. They look for sign. Mm -hmm. And there's a section in the book that talks about that, that uh, Katie has never seen one up close and personal. She's just seen one from a distance uh, as before it disappeared. 
behind a rock wow. and they look for a sign they look for scrape markings on on trees and on the ground and spray markings uh, snow leopards do a lot of spraying uh, that's their um, they call it female <laughs> yeah. they, they leave signs for other you know scent signs for other snow leopards and other animals to say you know i've been here this is the way i'm going yeah and uh but that's what what the the scientists look for is the sign the the scrapings and the scratch and the spray markings mm -hmm. uh, because they it, they're very they're not seen a lot but their markings are right but the footprints the pug marks they're just amazing and then they see the tail sometimes the difference between the wolf and the snow leopard if they're unsure of the paw print they'll see the tail has dragged behind in the snow oh I think we have a picture of that in the book oh, okay. where you can see the footprints across the snow but then you can also see the tail marking as it followed the cat so a wolf wolf tail isn't long enough to drag then right is it, it's what well, you're saying that them up a little bit more they okay. know they're not as long yeah i didn't realize they use that to wrap around their head kind of like a little homemade uh earmuff there like a muffler, yeah. yeah that's great yeah well, that's cool. So you had another essay for us, right, Siobhan? Well, I have from, another passage. Um, kind of entice us from, into the book. Bjorn wrote this. This was at the beginning of each of the chapters. Um, there's some thoughts about snow leopards and snow leopard photography. And um, this one is from a chapter that's called The Reward. And Bjorn writes, every day we are witness to the inexplicable beauty of our natural world. A sunrise, a sunset, a rainbow, the northern lights. Some are common occurrences we see often enough to take for granted, while others, like watching a baby being born or seeing a wild species in its natural habitat are perhaps once in a lifetime experiences. The reason some of these move us so profoundly is not always clear, but they leave us with a deeper appreciation for the universe's incredible design. There's a great deal we still don't understand about our natural world in general and about the snow leopard in particular but hopefully we will learn more some, but hopefully as we learn more, some of the mystery will remain. It isn't always necessary. We learn all there is to know in order to understand the importance or appreciate the beauty of something, especially this magnificent cat. Not every question has to be answered. Not every puzzle piece put in place. The unknown brings with it an incomparable thrill and beauty that touches us that's beautiful yeah and that's so true all we really need to know is how to uh coexist with these beautiful animals and, and keep them around on our planet so that's beautiful so bjorn is the uh co-editor correct or um mm -hmm. yeah yes he's of this book. he's from sweden and uh he's he started out in science and uh i think did some work in south africa um, either in school or as an intern. Uh, and he uh, he donates quite a bit of his proceeds from his photography to conservation. Oh, uh, wonderful. So he's, and that's why I said most of these, the pe well, all of the contributors are not just photographers. They're not just conservationists. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're not just writers. They're, they're everything. They, um, they can all write magnificently they all you know this photography is just unbelievable and their writings are you know it's just so beautiful but they also contribute to conservation because everywhere they go they are working for conservation conservation isn't just about science it's about working with people mm -hmm. and as jack can tell you it's all of you know it's all about working with the people and because those are the one, you know, the people who live there are the ones that are going to be the stewards. They're the ones that are going to protect these animals, these wild species. And uh, Jack knows yeah. firsthand, you know, about working with the people. Yeah. I love that line in the book that you gave uh, him. You, you bought a yak burger for a snow yeah. leopard. Yeah. That, that was just one of my favorite lines in the, <laughs> in the book. That's a great con contribution. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked to uh, Maria Aginova on this show on the podcast as well about um, Land of the Snow Leopard or the, the Land of the Snow Leopard Network, which I think is uh -huh. a great program. And I think that is doing what you're talking about too, bringing people together 
and you know wherever the the snow leopard exists and connecting people with the land and nature and and um we have a whole chapter devoted to land of the snow leopard network that darla hillard has written oh great in the book darla's Um, on too by the way hi darla hi darla (laughs) (laughs) about uh it's it's an organization, it's a, it's a network of organizations and individuals, over a hundred of them, that have come together um, to bring the spiritual aspect together with the biological science mm-hmm. to the local people. They work one-on-one, they, do, they work in schools, uh, they do programs for, you know, just regular school programs, they work with students in the field they work with townspeople in big groups but they uh, collect stories video written uh, pictures of things that have happened to people you know their interactions with snow leopards and stories ancient stories uh, the spiritual stories of the snow leopard is considered a spirit animal and they bring that so that into today and make it relevant Mm -hmm. um, to today's youth so that they can carry on the traditions and the folklore and uh, use that to uh, preserve the species. Yeah, and carry it forward. If the animal is important to you culturally, if the animal is important to you spiritually, then destroying that animal in retribution, you're going to think twice about it. And so... uh, by reviving their cultural traditions uh, it's it's a way of and they wanted to be part of conservation they wanted to be an active part of conservation and uh, so yeah that brings up a... worked very hard with the network to do that yeah and it's really it's expanding um, across I think about five different countries now so it's the program is expanding that is amazing. Well, it just brought up a comment that I was thinking that I don't think people really want to kill or harm such a beautiful animal. I mean, of course, if it is like killing all their goats or getting into their pen and, and such, it makes it difficult. But I think people would rather see them around. And like you said, yeah, you know, people really want to be involved. Livelihood. Marsha, if it wipes out your entire livelihood and all you make a year is three, four hundred dollars a year. I know. That snow leopard got in your corral and killed all your sheep in one night. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that's what they do, right? They'll just kill everything they do, that's they, moving. They, it seems that they're yeah. activated by movement and yeah. and then they, then they can't get out. And so then here comes the farmer in the morning and there's the snow leopard. And yeah. his first they, impulse is to kill that animal. But instead, because of conservationists working with them, they'll call someone, catch the snow leopard and remove it and move it someplace away Mm -hmm. because they'll they'll think twice because they realize that it means something to them. Plus, it's an economic thing. It's a financial thing. You know, if a tourist come in and pay them to stay in their homes, you know, that's that's a pretty, you know, better deal. Exactly. Yeah. It's as Rodney says, you want them. And as Jack said, you want them to be more important alive than dead. You want them to mean more alive than dead. If I may, one of the things the Snow Leopard Conservancy has done is help these communities have a livestock insurance program. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, in terms of the economics, you know, as, as Siobhan was saying, like a snow leopard can get into a pen and it very well may kill the entire herd or a large Mm -hmm. percentage of the herd and it may not eat much but once it's in there and its killer instincts are triggered by movement just gonna it go. can wipe okay. out dozens of animals and then strangely when approached by humans the cat will not defend itself Mm-mm. the oh, snow really? leopard does not it does not attack humans it does not fight back it will just cower and let itself be oh you, i didn't you know, know that so it attacked. makes it easier to shoot it that it's, way it's not it, that hard you know? to yeah. in relatively speaking i mean it's not gonna it doesn't fight back even though it obviously would be very capable of injuring a human um it doesn't fight back yeah but anyway with the livestock insurance program which was in place in the village where we were at you know immediately there was no question you know once they look at the kill and go yes this was a snow leopard we knew this man's going to be reimbursed for the value of that animal and so he really has no motivation immediately the, the motivation is removed and he's not worried about um his livelihood 
That's smart. That's smart. And I think when I spoke to Rodney a couple of years ago too, the uh, Snow Leopard Conservancy was also helping with some of these enclosures. I think some of the enclosures mm -hmm. didn't have roofs on them or and such. Yeah, and right. you know, you yeah. talk about how high they can jump and get into these pens and to kind of, I think, isn't that part of the conservation efforts too, to yeah, kind so of teach them of how the... to do the roofs on, yeah. on their crowds. They also have yeah. something called fox lights. Uh, a gentleman, Ian Whalen from Australia, had developed these predator lights, nighttime uh, lights, to keep predators away from his sheep. Mm. And he partnered with the Snow Leopard Conservancy, and we have been um, introducing them uh, all over the Snow Leopard's range. And they, what they do is they're solar powered batteries. And they come on after dark and they flash on and off in different colors and different patterns mm -hmm. so they don't become habituated to them. But they scare the snow leopards and the wolves away because they think it's a human with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. So they'll stay away. And they, they put them around where the yaks are and the sheep and the goats. And uh, they've been very successful uh, with the herders. Uh, oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Has, has a, you know, has, oh, go ahead, Jack. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so, you know, I live in California, uh, you know, Northern California, we have mountain lions and um, the mountain lion predation on livestock is a problem here mm -hmm. in exactly the same way that snow leopard predation is a problem on livestock in India. It's just that with the, the snow leopard conservancy has implemented these programs over there where they have, you know, many of these villages, they have livestock insurance they have the lights, they have roofs on their, um, their enclosures. And yet here in California, in the Western world, where we have, you know, such a wealthy, um, relatively speaking, um, population, right. we don't have any of those things in place. No. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic that, um, you know, yeah, we, we, we already, we already know what these solutions are. Right. And they've been implemented in India. But we haven't learned them here. But not here. Yeah. It, it's That's funny true. you should say That's that, Jack. I, I spoke at the Nashville, Tennessee Zoo one time about mm -hmm. snow leopards, and I showed them the fox lights. I had one with me, and the people are like, wow, can anybody order those? And I said, yeah, it's on the Internet. You just go to his website. And he's like, I would like those for my animals. I don't know what kind of animal he raised, but he was a farmer. He wanted them in Tennessee. And he says, right. I've never seen them. And I said, well, right. you can get them. That's and he awesome. said, I could use those here. Would they work? And I said, absolutely. They were designed for sheep in Australia. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they'll work with your farm animals here in the States. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Well, there's a so lot we can right. learn locally about the, these programs that would help us. That's true. I live in the, the same conflicts here. Yeah, I was going to say, I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains, too. And you mm -hmm. hear a lot of people where their goats are attacked by mountain lions and it's like, did you put them in a pen? <laughs> you know, did you put them in, you know, and they're like, <laughs> what, yeah. you know, husbandry. Yeah. yeah, you know, and then, you know, did you get a livestock guarding dog or, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of education to be done in our own area, which mm -hmm. you wouldn't think, but yeah. So it's interesting. So, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about a little bit, um, I guess, more about when the book is available and how people can can get that the release date as far questions. as i know is october 6th of this year okay and uh, it was to coincide with the wcn expo which unfortunately won't be held in person mm -hmm. this year will be held virtually and mm -hmm. then snow leopard day which is october 23rd but we um, are already taking pre-orders on our website um, if you just go to our our website uh, www.snowleopardconservancy.org and um, it's under on the hamburger menu on the side you go to the store and there's a, a separate tab just for searching for the snow leopard and you can order your copy through us or you can order it through Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Indie Books oh. uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble do ship internationally and then uh, Simon and Schuster is handling the international sales um, for so if you live outside the United States and your local you want your local bookstore to carry it Simon and Schuster would be the publisher that um, handles the sales to any bookstores outside of the United States 
Oh, but you can order it now, and as soon as we get them in, we'll be shipping them out. That's great. So you said it's at the printer now. So you you haven't have you seen a prototype of it printed? Yeah, uh, just no. the just the proofs, yeah. just that what went to the printer. Yeah, so, I'm and excited. It, of course, everything with the virus, everything is shut down, oh. and uh, everybody's operating on skeleton crews, and uh, it's it's printed overseas. So we were worried about shipments, but they're getting their shipments in. So. But it's a long process. I didn't know. I've learned a lot about publishing. <laughs> <laughs> but our publisher is um, Arcade Publishing. They're an imprint of Skyhorse Publishing. They're a small publishing house. Small. They have thousands of books. Yeah. But uh, they're from New York. So, and it's we have a really great editor, um, Cal Barksdale, and he's been helping us along. He's really on board with our message. And he loves snow leopards as much as all of us do. And it's been a it's been a joy to do this. It's been a, a three and a half year project so far for me. Oh, that's quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, it's Siobhan yeah. has done a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. I, yeah. I've, I have some sense of it. It's a huge well, project. Well, Jack, I couldn't so, have done it without all you guys helping me, yeah. boy. I just just um, organizing, getting all these contributors together, oh, getting the stories I, together. I it's just. Yeah, I give you a sneak peek in the preface of the book where I talk about how it all came together. I, I say, well, it was like herding cats, <laughs> and it, it's kind of been because we have one contributor in Nepal yeah. and Sweden and Spain and Canada, and then you know in Australia and there's some of us in the United States and it's, um, I'm up at all hours of the night talking to people and trying yeah. to catch them on Facebook Messenger and at different times of the day. And, <laughs> When I talked to our, our agent, Margaret G, who's, this is her fault. Uh, and uh, I have, we're 18 hours apart. So it's, it's quite a, an experience, that but is. it's been such an honor to work with all these people and to get to know them. And, and uh, I'm jealous that they've all been there <laughs> and they've all seen this beautiful animal in person. And uh, You'll get so there. I experienced I experience it through their eyes and yeah. through their writings. Yeah. Live if I can. may, though, um, the, w one of the things I love about this book is that it has really great photography mm -hmm. and really great um, text. You know, the essays and the foreword and everything that Siobhan wrote and everything. I mean, it's beautifully done and, um, in terms of the, you know, I really want to read it and I really want to look at the pictures. Right. And I have a lot of books on cats and I have a lot of photography books, but none of them have that quite that balance. Um, so I think it's kind of unique, actually. It, I think that's really great. A, 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 Marcia, it's not really a coffee table book, only yeah. that's what the trade would call it. It's it's an anthropological book. It's about our bond with this animal. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we're, we're bonded together and we need to protect it. We've endangered it. You know, we need to protect it. And it's, I didn't know where to begin, but it's, it's magical how all the essays and the photographs just blended together perfectly. Yeah. Uh, well, everybody's so passionate about it. And I think this is a really powerful way to get a message across to people who aren't scientists, who aren't, who are, you know, picking that up for the first time, just because maybe it's a beautiful picture of a cat and then they read it and they get involved and they hear these stories of the, the conservation and the legends and the, the mystical qualities, you know, and it's, it's going to be pretty powerful tool i think getting people our, our involved our cover photo um is oriel alamanis i'll show that back, again on the back is tashi golly oh i don't have the bat and said i think this should be on the cover and i said oh i agree jack what was that line that sentence that he put on the cover oh about inspiring our souls I can't, I, I don't have it in front of me right now. Is it on either. the book? You guys um, are just going to have to buy the Oh, the I don't have the back cover. Yeah. Just one sentence, really. Yeah. Um, but basically, that, you know, yeah. that we, you know, the, the snow leopard is that, it, it is that mystical creature. It is that thing that inspires our souls. And it definitely needs our protection. 
Um, yeah. yeah, I said it a lot more eloquently in the book. So well, you guys are going to have to buy the book to read it, but exactly, I, I you don't want to give too much away. Passage. Marsha, I wanted to read one more oh, yeah. of Bjorn's passages, and it, it's the beginning of the conservation chapter, which maybe some people will skip it because they think it's dry, but don't skip it because there's beautiful pictures in it, and there's a lot of really good information. This is a book for for scientists, for students, for cat lovers, for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and But it, it begins by saving the snow leopard, we're saving ourselves. Even with all the natural beauty around us, our world can be a harsh, ugly place. Day after day, we are fed news of wars, starvation, racism, and human injustice. Our thirst for optimism and beauty has probably never been stronger. But in our quest for spiritual well-being, we forget that true natural beauty is already out there. The snow leopard is one of nature's most exquisite creations. Long before humans appeared, it was roaming the snow-capped ridges of the mountains. Unmoved by human destruction and with wisdom reflecting in its iridescent blue-green eyes, it still patrols the ridges as it has done for so many centuries, watching over the world. And so we must do whatever we can to protect the snow leopard. Not only because its presence ensures the stability of the high mountain ecosystem, but also because this mysterious cat in some way provides hope for humanity. When we save the snow leopard, we're not just saving a species from extinction, we are saving ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And that he wrote that before, before the virus, before all of our, you know, uh, racial injustices in, in the, you know, this was written three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so appropriate for what's happening today. I agree. That they do give us hope for our future. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, and we all need a little bit of hope every now and then, these days anyways. But Katie Duffy is online. She has a comment. Um, she's ah! She's been, Hi, uh, <laughs> she said, let me see if part of it's cut off here. She's been listening in. It's been an hour or it's been an honor collaborating with the others involved. We may not have met in person, but we're all connected through such similar experiences. Can't wait for this incredible book to be out. So yeah. Thank you, Katie. So that's you nice. Guys, you, for everyone who gets the book and I hope everyone does. Yeah. Um, there's, the bio is about each one of the photographers and, mm -hmm. and um, everyone who participated has a bio in the back of the book. And they're fascinating because like I was saying before, each of these people are so multifaceted. Uh, Katie has been in the military. She, in school, she worked with reptiles and wolves. Wow. Uh, she works with one health, just amazing. They're all amazing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the forward. Uh, Rodney Jackson, our executive director for the Snow Leopard Conservancy, wrote the forward. And it's not just a forward, you know, just, you know, here's the book. It, he <laughs> actually tells his story. Yeah. And he has a, I, I'm, I wanted him to include his story, and he did without me even asking. He's got a great his, story. Yeah. Yes, his mystical experience, you have to read it. In the. It's just... Um, and I didn't even ask him and he told that story. And so everyone has a story in the book, except me, cause I haven't been there, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're it, passionate. Uh, yeah. But even the forward has, this is a book where you've got to read it from cover to cover and savor it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a good seven course meal. You've got to read and, and enjoy the photos. The photos, I try to accompany the text with the, the photos, uh -oh. tell a story as well and for kids of all ages we have a section right in the middle of the book which was margaret's original idea um did we lose jack we did oh no <laughs> i didn't uh, want to interrupt you I... <laughs> right in the middle of the book we have a section it's a seek and find section it's called the elusive leopard and it has a picture how the photographer took it and you have to find the snow leopard and then it has a blow up picture next to it you know a zoomed in yeah. where you can see where the snow leopard is so you can test your skills oh fun but, uh, <laughs> i like that i like how it went from a children's book to this uh the storybook like uh, yeah that's kind of cool 
So, well, I can't believe we lost 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 Jack we lost here. Jack. <laughs> so, hopefully we didn't yeah, anyways. Um but yeah, hopefully we didn't lose the whole connection with the world. But it's been about an hour, so um yeah, it, I just wanted to see or wanted you to share like where people can find you if they have questions and find more information about this. I know you mentioned the Snow Leopard Conservancy website, but you're also on social media. We're, yes, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Okay. Sign up for our newsletter. Uh, there's a sign up on Facebook. There's also a sign up on our website for our newsletter. Okay. And goes out once or twice a month and keep you um, in touch with what's going on in snow leopard conservation. Okay. And there's Jack. He's back. Yeah. Maybe he, <laughs> maybe it was due to the limit. Yay! Yeah, hey. He's back. He's back. <laughs> But uh, Jack, you have a website too. Each each of our contributors has a website. Do you want to share your website where they can find your photography? I think he's still checking in. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's right. okay. Um, I had I don't know what happened. I lost you guys. Yeah. Um, Jack Wonderly is my name. J A K. She said, but if you just Google Jack Wonderly. My website will come up. Okay. Uh, it's on the same thing on Instagram and Facebook. Jack Wonderly Photography. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So if we have any follow up questions, um, I'll try to forward to you all. But yeah, I'd like to ask you both. You know, we talked about hope a little bit. What, what what's giving you hope through all this with um, snow leopards, life, whatever? Is that too big of a question to ask? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. What, what gives you the most hope? Yeah. Well, I think, I think, especially now with the pandemic, and I don't want to try to get philosophical about a, a virus, but, you know, it, it's a pause, right? And they've called it the, you know, um, is it anthropause? Is that the word they've come up yes. with? Yeah. yeah. That humanity has, we hit the pause button. And I think that we're learning to flex these muscles of cooperation and international cooperation and yeah. maybe not being so selfish and thinking you know what we all have to pitch in here we have to wear a mask we're gonna you know make certain sacrifices and stuff those are the muscles that we need to learn to flex to solve the larger conservation issues the climate change issues um so you know i see hope when i go outside i see you know the animals i see deer in my yard the quail the rabbits you know i go to the beach and there's sea lions and, and um you know the animals are doing well in, in our time of difficulty in our absence <laughs> i know in our absence that says right? a lot really, doesn't it <laughs> nature is so restorative if we just leave it alone yeah yeah they don't need us yeah they, they, they don't need us they don't need except us. We where we've <laughs> except where we've mucked it up so much that we have to come in and and put it back together right? yeah 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 but generally yeah if we if, if they're in any good shape at all if we just leave them alone they thrive interesting you know you're at the wildlife rescue i wanted to ask are you seeing an increase or of animals coming into the rescue center at all or is they're, it actually i think their numbers decrease. are up a little bit this oh, year they are um maybe i would think down maybe are, um huh. they've had more than 700 animals in uh, in the first half of the year, which I think is a little bit of an increase. Oh, okay. It's packed. They're very, very busy. Yeah, our, our local are, wildlife it's, it's rehab havers here in this oh, area right. are just swamped. They, they, they're inundated. They can't take anymore. They've got so many, mostly birds. Yeah, uh, yeah. In our area, actually, right during nesting season, um, the power company decided to come and trim trees. I'm like, why are you waiting till nesting season to come trim trees? So um, very frustrating. Yeah. So there's probably a lot of baby birds and squirrels and such. But yeah, it's so funny. You guys can't see it. But while I've been sitting here by the river, uh, a huge flock of Canada geese are around me and they came right up behind me and were listening while we were talking. So oh, funny. <laughs> Surprised <laughs> right we didn't hear me. them. <laughs> <laughs> there's tons. Of, there's probably 50 of them out here and they all came right up behind me. They wanted to hear. So oh, funny. <laughs> so, so what gives you hope, Siobhan? Well, the youth. I know Rodney looks to the youth. There's so many young people mm -hmm. interested in conservation and you know helping us with climate change and preserving these species and the next generation of conservationists 
Um, and so many people that actually that live in these countries are interested. You know, it used to be, you know, the Europeans and Americans would go there and then leave. Mm -hmm. And now it's more and more people who are actually, you know, from those countries want to participate in, in conservation and ecology and environmental studies and politics and every economics and everything that goes into conservation because conservation isn't just science right it's, it's it can everything. be photography and, uh, art yeah writing yeah it, oh yes and it's the youth and the next generation and how passionate they are and how they're really interested in, and and uh, like jack said you know time to work together mm -hmm. and actually using these technological tools that we're using today the zooming and stuff for a purpose to actually do good with it yeah yeah but it's yeah i think it's been helpful so well thank you you guys give me hope for everything you're doing and um keep doing what you're doing and i'll keep trying to get the word out there but um i really appreciate you and all that you're doing so thank you so well, thank you for having us marcia thank and you thank you so much jack for working with me on this project oh, i can't it was, wait it was no i mean to have the experience was great to share it is just as great yeah um so thank you siobhan for all your work on the book i know it was an epic amount of work <laughs> yeah a lot of your You're Facebook posts, again. your Facebook posts, I'm editing again. I've got, I'm editing again. another you time. Again. Yeah. Can you see the geese? Oh, yeah. There Look at go. them. They're all, yeah, they're all taken off. They're all babies. Oh, that's adorable. They're all teenagers. <laughs> Looks like a beautiful day there. Jeez. Yeah. It is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So, well, well, good. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. And um, buy well, the book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. And if we didn't get to your questions, we will try to get them after. But um, I think I got everybody. So a lot of hellos. So you may want to go to the live version and um, say hello or if you want. It's up to you. But anyways, I will end it. If you guys want to stay on for a second, that's fine. But okay. bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.